In the last video, we talked about one consideration or thing you have to think about when choosing the different types of markers you use for your study is whether that marker is neutral or adaptive. Another consideration we'll talk about in this video is what type of genome the marker you're using is in. So in the last module, we talked about different types of genomes, about biparental and uniparentally inherited genomes. So we're going to build on that in this video. And like I said, we have talked about this before. So to refresh your memory and to practice recalling that information, first, please think about what are some examples of uniparentally inherited DNA. Remember, that means they only come from one of the parent organisms. So some examples we talked about last time for plants, we talked about chloroplast DNA. And remember we said that in plants, given the option, this is used most commonly for an organelle genome. We talked about the Y chromosome. We talked about that example with the Isle Royale wolves and how the Y chromosome can be used to track paternal inheritance because it's only inherited from the father. And then the other, type we talked about is mitochondrial DNA. And this is the one we're going to focus on most in this video because we're going to see it a lot this semester. And because many, many molecular ecology studies use mitochondrial DNA. And in fact, that example I've been talking about throughout this module, this paper is the one Kelly and Palumi from 2010 that found that different populations of that intertidal snail from Oregon to Southern California were all the same. That study used mitochondrial DNA. So as I said, animal mitochondrial DNA is very popular in molecular ecology studies. So before we get into the rest of this video, I want you to think about why do you think that is? So based on what you already know about mitochondria, which we've talked about a little bit already, or maybe what you've read in the textbook, why do you think mitochondrial DNA is used so much in molecular ecology studies? So there are a couple reasons and all walk through those now with some examples. So one reason mitochondrial DNA is used so often is that it has what we call a conserved arrangement of genes across taxa. So here, what I'm showing are two pretty different organisms. On the left here is an isopod, and on the right are muscles. And so when we say mitochondrial DNA has a conserved arrangement of genes, that means that even though these two organisms are very different, you can actually use the same set of PCR primers on both of these organisms. And that's because their mitochondrial DNA is very conserved, meaning the actual sequences in some regions of that mitochondrial DNA are similar. And so we'll talk about this more later, but that means that we're, it's easier to do studies on an isopod, for instance, if this is a new organism that you haven't studied before, you can use some of the molecular techniques and toolkits that have already been developed for other organisms like mussels, and you can use them on isopods as well. In fact, last year when I taught Bio 178, there was a group that did their group project on isopods and they used some PCR primers that also work on muscles and echinoderms and things like that. So that's an advantage. It makes it easier to work with mitochondrial DNA because they have this conserved arrangement. Another reason why mitochondrial DNA is so popular is that it has a high mutation rate. And so what that means is that there's high, what we call polymorphism. That just means poly meaning many, morphs meaning different forms. And high polymorphism means high variability. And that's a good thing because we want high variability if we want to differentiate or study 
individuals of the same species. So like that other example I used with the intertidal snails, we're looking at individuals of the same species that are just located in different geographic regions. And so that one study I talked about, they used mitochondrial DNA and they were able to do that because even though we were looking at individuals of the same species, the high variability in mitochondrial DNA allowed us to differentiate those different individuals. This is a picture of a Daphnia, which is a freshwater tiny little organism, and they've also used mitochondrial DNA to study Daphnia in different freshwater ponds, for instance. Another positive aspect of working with mitochondrial DNA is that it's very numerous, like we've talked about before, so there are many, many more mitochondrial genomes in each cell compared to nuclear genomes. And because it's so numerous, it can more easily be recovered from degraded DNA. And this can be beneficial in a couple different scenarios. So here on the left, I'm showing a picture of someone taking a sample from a museum specimen. So you can actually take mitochondrial DNA from organisms that are extinct, for instance, and actually preserved in museums, and you can recover mitochondrial DNA from that organism more easily than nuclear DNA because that mitochondrial DNA is so numerous. So museum specimens are one application for mitochondrial DNA. Uh, another is for eDNA studies, which we've talked about briefly before. So e, the E in eDNA stands for environmental. And the basis of an environmental DNA study is that all organisms like this fish that are shown, that's shown here release their DNA into the environment. But once it's released into the environment, it's affected by all these factors like light, temperature, microbes and enzymes that are present in the water, the amount of time it's present in the water. All of those factors contribute to degrading the DNA. So if you are doing an eDNA study and you want to investigate DNA that's already been shed from these organisms and is in the environment, it's best to use a mitochondrial DNA marker because you'll be able to more easily recover that mitochondrial DNA even though that DNA is degraded. Another benefit for mitochondrial DNA, like we said, it's uniparentally inherited. And so because of that, you can use mitochondrial DNA to track individual lineages throughout time. So they've done this, they've used mitochondrial DNA to study sperm whales, for instance, and to track the maternal lineages of, of these different pods of sperm whales throughout time. So if you're especially interested in what's happening from the maternal side, so what females are mating and passing down to their offspring, mitochondrial DNA is a really good marker for that. Mitochondrial DNA is also sensitive to what we call demographic events. So an example of a demographic event is something like a bottleneck. So on this graph, we have population size on the y-axis and throughout time, something happens here. So it could be some catastrophic event. So um, a big flood or something that really hurts the population. And right when that event happens, the population numbers really decline for that species. And one of the reasons why using mitochondrial DNA is good is because it's really sensitive to these types of events. So if you're sampling individuals at this time point in the recovery period, for instance, if you're using a different type of marker, you might never be able, you might never know that this bottleneck event happened. But in conservation, which we'll talk about later, it's actually really important to know if these bottleneck events happened or not, even though they happened in the past. And mitochondrial DNA and using mitochondrial markers, because they're sensitive to those events, they will be able to reveal whether something like that bottleneck event happened in the past. As with all things, many things we've talked about already this module, 
it's important to remember there are caveats, right? So there are some times when it's really good to use mitochondrial DNA, but there are also some things to keep in mind as a caveat. And one of those caveats is that mitochondrial DNA doesn't always represent the whole population. So if we think back to this sperm whale example I showed a couple slides ago, we said that this was good for tracking maternal lineages. And that's again because the mitochondria is only inherited from the mother. If we were using data that we obtained from mitochondrial DNA and saying that it applied to the whole population, whole population meaning both males and females, that might not actually be true because when you're using mitochondrial DNA, you're only looking at things that are maternally inherited. So it's important to keep in mind when you're doing your study, your results might not be applicable to the whole population. And then this here is just a quick note. Um, these little guys are copepods. There's a little insert box in your textbook about cytonuclear incompatibility. I don't have time to go into it. I just wanted to mention that it's really cool. And um, my advisor actually has studied this extensively throughout his career, so he would be really upset with me if he knew that I didn't mention it at all. Um, so this is just a note to say, read that part of your textbook. It's really interesting. Hopefully we'll get to it later in the semester. Um, but if you want to know more about it, um, ask me because it's a pretty cool phenomenon that hopefully we can explain later.